our topic has said is quality in emergency care from different perspectives. And I will start by just saying something that's, um, that's written all over when you're reading books on quality. And it says that the responsibility for the quality of care lies jointly on the organization and on individuals within the organization. Um, so many times when I have dealt with quality, everybody says, um, my pet name around the hospital has been E.T. And I, I will get to hear words like E.T., that's your thing, you finish, and then we go back to what we do every day. And yet here is quality being defined as everyone's responsibility, the organization itself, but also the individuals within the organization. So um, while I say that about quality, I'll tell you some principles behind it, some truisms. Uh, truly, healthcare delivery is complex. We all know, um, I hope the audience, most of you are either in healthcare or participate in healthcare or have gone to seek healthcare services. Um, so the complexity of healthcare is known, um, but there are basic assumptions about it. Um, we need to improve. And despite its complexity, um, it has so many things you need to coordinate. And therefore, the implication of its complexity is that that coordination must be done in precision and in a quality way. For example, when I say it's complexity and it involves so many other people, um, let me take the surgical procedure um, and, and not an emergency example. Uh, perhaps there's an, a surgical procedure being done, but um, no matter how great the surgeon and anesthetist are, um, we can have lousy, lousy outcomes. If, for example, uh, the anesthetist uh, wanted a cross-matched blood in time and then it's not available. No matter how brilliant they are, there begins quality countdowns. Um, perhaps sometimes we haven't provided the right drugs for the anesthesia. Again, there the quality of the, of, of the surgery starts being affected. Um, so really, um, in the end, we might have a patient with an infection who may not have, may have new morbidities and the infection may be a resistant infection. It'll mean they stay longer. So really what I'm saying is coordination is necessary to avert that truism of complexity. Um, and so these functions need to work together for better outcomes. Another truism is that change is difficult. Um, uh, Tim, even from your own personal example, you know how difficult it is to change until unless you're seriously motivated by something. Often, often um, you know, um, it's an incentive that, um, believe it or not, does not necessarily mean it's financial. And I'll give an example of physicians since um, uh, Washira said we are friends, we won't become enemies. We all know physicians are difficult people. And um, uh, one of the things over time in quality I've understood about it is that it's because they're very self-sufficient by nature in, in that the world, in their complex, in their way of doing things at care level, um, they, 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 they sort of self-sufficiently look at the issue, uh, diagnose it, make a decision on what management, and therefore it, it looks, well, we will say we, are, we perceive them as difficult to change, but they are. Um, what then makes them motivated to change? Believe it or not, it must be that they will see an improvement in the tool that you're trying to provide or in the quality you're trying to implement that truly affects the patient outcome to a positive level. That way, they then um, get attracted to this quality issue and they are motivated to, 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 to sort of participate in that quality from that angle. Another aspect of truism is command and control is inappropriate. I tell you in healthcare, if you want to be, sorry, if you want to, if you want to do well, don't, don't try to command and control um, everything. It's impossible in its complexity. While yet we are saying that it's, um, it's important to be um, in an authoritative manner put in some systems, um, a central command and control approach has been vilified in modern knowledge in industry, which is what health service is. You cannot control everything. Each individual must exercise his own professional and knowledge 
um, in, in order to cope effectively with this complexity of healthcare. So um, you have to be able to uh, differentiate between command and control and accountability. You need to decentralize that accountability, bring it to the level of small teams, put team leaders, empower them, select them and with suitability in mind, and then empower them. That way, um, you will be able to, um, to avoid this truism of command and control that can lead to inappropriate um, quality outcomes. Now, and the last truism in this slide is variation will occur and is not necessarily bad. That is true. And we all know that uh, some variations are not necessarily to point at wrong things, but um, they help you think through your quality cycles. Um, the PDCA, which every, perhaps the audience and, and, and those acronyms um, correct me when I, when I say them, uh, plan, do, check, act, cycles, assume as an example of, of a tool that's used to, to, to you know, look at improvement, um, it assumes that the basic premise is that is right. So when, the, when it says plan, do, check, act, it means when you are planning, that premise is right. But sometimes, is it? Can it be altered? Um, can it be that the premises of what you started on was probably not right? For example, we may assume that a reason for a particular service uh, to be unpopular is we, we all will start saying, let's plan to, disc uh, to discuss why patients are dissatisfied in this zone. It's because people here are not courteous. So your premise is courtesy is the issue. So you plan, you do, you check and act on improving on courtesy. But is it time for you sometimes uh, to look at um, and review the assumption? Um, because if you don't, the implication would be that you're working on the wrong variation. So it could be that they were dissatisfied with waiting time and, and therefore judged staff members as being uncourteous because they don't talk to them about waiting time. So sometimes you need to review that assumption um, so that there is improvement. Challenge it. It's important for a characteristic of progressive quality change. I've taken long on that so that you understand the foundation before we just go to the different perspectives. And in that then, we move to if these truisms and implications and uh, uh, truisms lead to these implications, we then go to gurus who've talked and worked before us on quality. One of them is Edward Deming. He's actually known as the father of quality. And I've put in those quotes that he had put in, in his books and in, 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 in areas where you'll be reading on quality, you will find such things. In God we trust, all others must bring data, meaning you must be measuring something. Just because you can measure everything doesn't mean you should. So are you looking at the assumption of, again, are you challenging it? Is everything that you're collecting um, important for you to measure to see the outcome? Or is there certain things you're not even measuring that you need to look at? It's not enough to do your best. You must know what to do and then do your best. That's a quality quote from Edward Deming. And another one is, growth comes from repeat customers. So whose perspective will you be looking at quality from? Customers that boast about your products and service and they bring their friends over. Another guru of quality, uh, known as Duran, um, and I'm sure you've heard that word. Um, this one is known as an architect of quality. And he, this one says, without a standard, there's no logical basis for making a decision or taking action. Um, another quote, Duran says, it is important that top management be quality minded. In the absence of sincere manifestation of interest at the top, little will happen below. And another quote of Duran is, 85% of the reasons for failure to meet customer expectations are related to deficiencies in systems and processes rather than the employee. So it's not individual issues, it's systems, it's processes. If you have to then look at quality improvement, that's where you begin. And therefore, once again, so what's quality and from whose perspective are we going to define these qualities? Is it from provider, patient, caregiver, or insurance? I threw in a little um, teaser there on insurance corporate of pair. And let's see, is that, is that a perspective to look at in measuring quality? In providing healthcare, there are risks, though, as we look at all those aspects, and each one needs to be minimized for quality assurance program to, to improve. 
And so, what's quality paper as an example? It's not toilet paper that's inferior. Actually, the purpose is the decisive factor. So, quality is defined through the purpose and through the eye of who is looking at it. And so, when we say uh, the definitions that come along is quality is the extent to which an actual performance is conforming with a preset criteria for good performance. So that criteria has been set to mean if that's the standard, then we measure it, then we know whether your performance is good. We know this definition, another definition um, in healthcare, quality of care is the degree to which health services for individuals and populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with current professional knowledge and standards. And I think in that sense, um, um, we, we can tell that when that definition of healthcare quality was provided, um, it, it, it clearly means it's different um, aspects, person-centered. It's about desired outcomes depending on the disease you're in. It's evidence-based. It's based on standards. Um, it's sometimes on populations, but closer to the desired outcome. And, and in this, I always remind people, sometimes, unfortunately, the outcome um, is, is end of life. But there is still a measure of quality, even when you're dealing with end of life in healthcare. So it is to that extent. Um, it's not always perhaps a good story of um, well mother, well baby in an obstetrics area, in an emergency unit where you receive all these types of things, look at the measures that you might be anticipating. And so these frameworks were set for that reason, the Institute of Medicine Framework for Healthcare Quality. Um, it's about safety. Um, and um, in, 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 as we look at it from whose perspective, it's to reduce the aspects of uh, injuries. It's about effectiveness, scientific knowledge. And we've seen the definition, it's beneficial to both the patient, the provider, um, and, and of course you as a healthcare uh, worker as well. It must be patient-centered, providing that, um, that care that's respectful and responsive. So that's why we said in reference to values, needs, no matter at what spectrum they're in in their healthcare. Timeliness, no matter how brilliant you are, and you are now we are going to focus on emergency units. You, you, might, you might have the best personnel, the best equipment and everything that comes along and the ambience. But if your patients come and uh, they needed certain protocols followed of um, brain is muscle, you know, and, and so on, and there's no timeliness to it, or the turnaround time for labs are forever, um, you know, it, it, it really then doesn't fall into the healthcare quality framework. So it needs to be timely, reducing waste, um, um, and timings and, and giving it based on um, the evidence that's supposed to be. It must be efficient, efficient, which is avoiding waste and supplies and equitable. Put that in mind when we look at from whose perspective. It must be not uh, um, driven by the gender, ethnicity, geographic location or socioeconomic status. And so uh, in that way, what it's saying is quality needs to be proactive and not reactive. I put in that slide so that you understand that um, in all this then, that thing of uh, let's wait for the problem to occur, it's waiting time. Okay, let's deal with waiting time. Let's wait for um, uh, to see if we have bad outcomes. Okay, then let's deal with the bad outcomes. What this is saying in the journey is, is proactive. Think through before. Are you planning as a provider? Are you planning as a healthcare worker? Are patients uh, um, thinking through what their expectations are and are they demanding of what they need? Um, so again, in that framework of healthcare, it's therefore then about structure, process and outcome. John Abadian's framework is the one that defines it that way. So we move to this complexity, it will be like an orchestra where we are saying it's complex, it's healthcare, we want to deliver it in an emergency unit um, there are all these players. Um, people are looking at it as quality from different perspectives, but hey, we've got one common goal. And so each one matters. So we're going to say, what's the provider perspective? It matters for that tune to come out right, which is optimal outcomes in, 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 in what 
the healthcare is supposed to be. So from the provider perspective, what is quality? I'll start with that quote, which is actually from um, Emily Arson and uh, an article I read uh, from, their, uh, uh, from a paper they wrote. Um, and it said, lack of senior management with strong commitment or training in quality improvement methods limited uh, methods limits resor limited resources to collect and analyze data and a lack of clarity around, with, around which metrics are most important have all been noted to limit institutional abilities to effectively measure the quality of care. And I think earlier on, I had, you'd seen some of the gurus who talked about um, top leadership um, supporting it. So clearly, the provider here, which is the facility, the emergency unit, needs to think through um, and the leaders therein and the hospital owners or um, need to think through what are they providing, what methods of training and, and resources are they willing to give. In this um, uh, country we are in or world we are in, there is com competing interests. An expanding interest in the development of emergency care by clinicians and policymakers in already resource limited setting underscores the need to measure and improve the quality of care delivered. That way, then you will put in resources appropriately and not have waste. And we're already competing, it's resource limited. Surely, we want to have to look at it um, from that perspective of improvement. Um, so, there are basic concepts in this perspective from the provider that we need to look at, the foundation itself, which is an expectation of the provider to have an infrastructure, a process, and, 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 and of course, results. It builds on what Donna Baden had said, structure, process, outcome. And then the key questions the provider must ask themselves, even as they provide these qualities, what's this? You must keep asking yourself, What's the level of care this facility is providing? That way you can determine what am I setting up? What haven't I put up? It's not one day you're doing this, the next day you're not. You have to think through uh, the level of care. That's your measure of quality from the perspective of the provider and the expectation of the provider. Um, what level of trauma, if you're going to deal with trauma, um, what level of trauma can I deal with? If I cannot deal with it, then how will I communicate this and be able to put in protocols to transfer to the next level of care? What preparations must I have in my emergency unit? What patients uh, burden can I take in my emergency unit? Um, what standards and measures am I going to put? Um, this includes providing the appropriate resources and supplies and equipment. So, I mean, the provider's measure of quality must come from that. And it's not just the measure, it's also an expectation. So this provider must put in systems and standards in the emergency unit um, for continuous improvement and um, also provide timely communication and feedback about um, these uh, quality improvement uh, agendas. Again, the provider is expected and needs to measure quality uh, by having policies and protocols, guidelines, pathways, evidence-based standard operating um, procedures, all those names are, are relevant. What we are saying, the provider needs to be the one who has put those things in place. Whatever terminology you use, policies, protocols, as I've said, standard operating procedures, flaws, um, you need to be the one to provide that, including, as I've said, because depending on what you've chosen to do or not be able to do in the emergency unit, in the hospital that you've had at work, yes, perhaps we are doing, um, uh, we are a stroke center, we are certified, we are a cardiac center, we are certified, we are a trauma center, but there are some units that need to transfer. They can, they can manage excellent emergency services to a certain level, but need to transfer. So it includes putting those processes because you do not want your great work interfered with because you don't have a good transfer system. Then the other transfer system that I'm talking about is within emergency setups, transferring from there to a cath lab. Maybe it's far away or to an, or an, an OR. 
those are the protocols you must have in place or guidelines or pathways or whatever it is that you call uh, systems to be able to uh, provide quality care. So an emergency, to provide that emergency care, then you must have that. And that quality is measured by the provider and, um, and supported by the provider. Um, another um, aspect um, of the provider is um, recruiting, right? You know, um, it is their responsibility. It is the responsibility of the facility owners, facility leaders, um, unit managers, or heads of, um, of, of units that um, run emergency units to provide the skillful um, kind of personnel to be able to implement these guidelines. Um, you know, you, you, um, you can have, again, everything right, but if you don't have the right skill, there comes another issue of quality. Another expectation of measuring quality from whose perspective under the, the umbrella of the provider is resource allocation in terms of supplies and equipment. You've thought through what you want to start in the emergency unit, the service line, the guidelines, then you must then support those, those guidelines, those processes for it to match the quality that you're expecting. Um, and I should have put this skill mix um, alongside the correct numbers. Um, I, I, I can already see a few people smiling. Yes, it is the expectation of the facility owners, not only to appropriately staff, but uh, uh, appropriately give the numbers uh, based on uh, an evidence-based calculation um, of staffing, not um, a bit right. this is night, so night there are less numbers, so I'm going to leave you alone or um, this is day, so it looks like uh, we our hospital is very, very near busy highway. Um, maybe during the day, you might be a little busier. So let me provide you the biggest staff numbers in the day. No, I mean, it's got to be based on some evidence and, and some appropriateness as well. So that's the expectation um, in terms of the facility. Um, um, you, you need to look at all those things so that you're able to then provide optimal care and, and measure that care. So if, if I would say in a facility, the measure of, of, of quality is the ability to measure that um, essentially in a successful way and to implement the culture of, of clinical governance. And in clinical governance within the structure, and I, I started with facility because a lot of it um, obviously falls into this in terms of responsibility. Um, the, the, the facility needs to have that framework for continuous improvement. It needs to be the one to set the standard high. It needs to provide that environment with excellence for us to flourish if you have to provide that healthcare. Um, there are many tools, as we've seen, that uh, can support this clinical governance. There's nothing new about these quality tools. I won't even bore you. You've had them before. Um, it has its pluses. It has its minuses. Um, so, example, the evidence-based one, um, uh, generalized, it can be very poor um, if you just generalize it. Um, there are so many different circumstances, biological, others related to a service delivery that the evidence doesn't apply to. So, of course, people can get tired and say that doesn't apply to us. And, and, and usually, um, again, healthcare providers are very good at saying, oh, that doesn't even work in Kenya, where they even bring in these things of evidence, this kind of evidence to Africa or Kenya. Um, uh, another one of continuous professional development, sometimes you wonder, is it content? How do you measure? Um, is it the pleasure of the industry to just learn? Um, while yet it's great, we need to also measure its effectiveness. What I'm saying is these tools can't be only one only. They're all very important. The effectiveness of what we're learning, uh, does it grow our professional um, um, interventions um, and so on? Um, does it reflect on our experiences and, and, and truly in our disciplines and, and, and organizational disciplines? Um, so I, I, I guess even now when I move to appointment appraisal credentials, you know, uh, sometimes they've been used against um, individuals. And so um, good selection and constructive appraisals um, with careful delineation and privileges um, can work. But if misused to a bureaucratic way or a way of um, being punitive, it won't work. 
And that would be the same thing about patient satisfaction. If you use it only to blame as incidences and pinpoint, it will be used, it will not be taken positively. So again, it's, it's, it's all of them that are tools that support the governance, support the facility, but you've got to be careful. And even in audits, measure right. Measure the right effect of your quality. Pay attention to the, that that you're measuring that adds value. Equally for all, don't pinpoint because you want the emergency department is so busy, but um, you're playing around the issue of waiting time. So you only want to measure the waiting time. More well, yet, there could be other measures of outcomes that are working so well. Um, in view of these drawbacks, I, I repeat, you have to work in all of them. They all make sense, but use the tools appropriately. And I, I would suggest you don't rely on one tool. While clinical governance um, publicly talks about um, all these things, it's important for ER or emergency room or emergency units or for you to be able to give emergency care efficiently. You must look at these things in terms of lapses in quality. For example, unexpected returns to the emergency or wrong diagnosis. You must look at access issues and an even distribution of services. For example, um, admission bed facilities, your waiting periods, you know, you're waiting to move this patient to other places. The critical care is full. There's no availability in the operating room. What happens to these patients while they are there? Um, how do you distribute this in, in the services in public and private sector? Um, how do you transfer to each other? How, what's your collegiality like um, when the primary is moving from, uh, when a patient is moving from maybe a secondary a hospital to a tertiary hospital, how are you doing that? And within that tertiary hospital, I repeat, what are your holding areas like in the emergency unit for them to measure their quality service? Is geographical variation in practice different in the emergency unit? Um, is it that when you're further away from the cities, the resources are difficult? So in an emergency unit, which is from my village, and I won't tell you which village I'm from, but if you're in my village in an emergency unit, will I get the same care? that I might get in Nairobi City in one of the prestigious hospitals in an emergency care. Is, 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 does it matter how far I am from what we would see as the um, um, you know, um, big cities? Does it matter? But you, you, you have to measure this quality in, in all those emergency units regardless and equip them um, with the resources that they need. Uh, clinical governance will also help you display your indicators. It's time that we started putting them in our waiting areas. Uh, what's our wait times? What's our turnaround times of our labs? Um, we need to compare this data. And I wrote there internationally and internationally. Um, I think it's time we started facility star ratings on measures of quality uh, because uh, um, we need to be held accountable as facilities. And it's not a measure of poor staffing or whatever. It's it's genuinely time that we move that clinical governance to that area. It's time we displayed uh, our downtimes. Why is the CT scan down as emergency unit? You're not making the decisions that you're meant to make because CT scans are down. Then let that indicator be part of your, of your, of, of your outcome. So you're not quite blamed for wrong outcomes. You say, no, it's because our turnaround times are, are down. Your, our downtime or CT scan is so, is so much. Um, now we're having to transfer patients. And um, again, if you don't do this anyway, as a facility, things have changed. Uh, there is relatively strong professional power and more informed clients. Um, medical litigation has gone up and costs um, and, and people are more aware. Um, manpower threats are there. Uh, many times, you know, people are migrating. Um, and so it, it, it's time we looked at quality satisfaction so that these facilities retain uh, the right skill. And truly, it simply improves patient outcomes. So again, fundamentally, let's look at uh, um, about the ability to produce effective changes in the high quality care. Um, it's about challenging mindsets, developing collective solutions. Therefore, um, um, let's co collect the right data. Let's use what we have to ask questions um, our IT systems, we have enough to make those decisions. Um, we, we can look at the problems, um, use clinical governance, find solutions, um, do audits, collaborate, 
plan your audits well for quality improvements, uh, secure continuous quality improvements, and they should support um, all that. Um, share learnings uh, with internal and external providers, as I said, harmonize reported uh, performance indicators, uh, local adaptation. And, and, and I think this is also one of the things that um, I am saying for facilities to improve and quality to be measured through that. Um, it's time we started sharing, um, honestly, um, uh, international data, international, intranational. Um, because if we don't do that, our quality metrics um, is always compared outside, but it doesn't mean in here we don't have ways in which we can um, critically look at improving our quality. So although the major focus um, in Australia Commission, and, and I was reading this on safety, um, is, is, is looking at standardization out there, um, these clinical areas are limited in scope. The information is more detailed and better validated from than from administrative databases. That's what they're saying about the Australian Commission, um, that um, it, it has better data. But in my view, as I said, it's great, but it's important for us to move on to benchmarking within ourselves uh, for standardization and definitions. Although, of course, um, those definitions and comparisons of similar groups, patients is essential, I know. This agreement is not there. Um, they already fight internationally, let alone nationally. I know, I know it will be sensitive. And, and, I, I, and I can already hear, uh, what if our waiting times are so bad, will patients stop coming to us and start going to another place? I mean, well, it's time we started thinking, yeah, maybe the emergency units need to think, yeah, yeah, it's time that people started looking at it uh, that way. Um, and not everything is straightforward. Trust me, I, I get it. We all do. A quality indicator, for example, from an emergency unit, which um, um, uh, Dr. Washira can attest to, sometimes you're like, such as readmissions to come back to the emergency unit, um, it, it may look like a negative um, um, indicator. But it seems straightforward, but at the same time, um, in the example I've given, does a return of a patient with abdominal pain and appendicitis uh, the following day represent bad care when it was one possibility? of an early and appropriate discharge with undiagnosed abdominal pain. Um, actually, if you look at it, having no unplanned readmission can also be negative. It means you're inappropriately just admitting everybody. That's why no one comes back. So you can debate. Uh, but again, it's measures that you can have to look at in details. Um, so truly quality from an emergency provider perspective requires a lot of comprehensive frameworks, integration, so that those crowds, those demands, those time targets are met. Um, it's about um, promoting small number of isolated continuous quality initiatives without integrating them into a larger comprehensive quality program that measures structure, process, and outcomes across the Institute of Medicine domains of quality is a risk that you can avoid. In addition, it will be important to ensure an appropriate governance structure, as I've said, which has um, supportive evidence um, so that your emergency care services move on. So that's quality from, from, um, from a perspective of the facility. It's those pillars, system awareness, teamwork, communication, ownership, and leadership, alongside those effectiveness, those pillars that you see there, learning, strategy, resource communication, patient experience, risk management, and clinical effectiveness. In that, the house will come out better for the facility. Now I'll move to the patient perspectives. This one will be a little faster. Um, from the patient perspective, what's quality? And uh, whenever you speak to patients, and maybe there's some online who have been patients and families who have been pati patients themselves, um, they view it from their experience. What people say, their satisfaction rates. Um, it's really what they experience. And um, sometimes it's moving forward to not just experience, expectation that measures that experience. So if I was expecting, um, uh, perhaps, I don't know, I'm not sure which restaurant is very common, um, but if I was expecting from the kiosk that's outside my house, I was going to buy some, some food that they make there, and I was expecting a certain level of taste, um, and my experience was way out. I read them 100%. Um, and 
if I'm going or when I'm taken that this one usually it must be someone paying for it uh, to a high end restaurant and I, I am expecting that the quality of that food will be so, you know, throw me out of this world and I get the same taste I got from my kiosk, I read them poorly. Not because the food is bad. How, how is it that I loved the kiosk food? It was not bad. It really tasted nice. But I set a different expectation for this high-end restaurant. So it's the same thing for patients. Experience versus also expectation. And another way patients view quality is from what they hear from others. They may never have come to your institution, but from the different platforms, which I can't mention, you all know them. Um, here, say gossip, social media, real media, uh, mainstream media, whatever we call it. Um, discussions in salons, in, in weddings, in parties. Everybody's talking. That's where they're getting feedback. And they determine their quality on that. Um, and another way um, is by giving them information. They perceive your quality. Um, when you empower them. It's time we continue to do so, empowering patients with accurate information rights to participate more in their healthcare decisions because that way they are going to view quality from now, uh, perhaps I would say an informed perspective. But so far, um, with the little that you're giving them, they are forming quality um, uh, perspectives of your care. And I think we need to encourage this latter one so that uh, the ones that are inappropriate are not, um, don't become gospel truth. So from a patient's perspective, the center here is, is where you need to, to look at um, their view. Um, it's clean, safe. Um, are you treated with dignity? Are you treated with respect? Is it timely? Is it appropriate and consistent really with what they came for? So this is the framework that patients use their access in terms of timeliness, safety, error-free, uh, their satisfaction service, and their appropriateness in terms of what they thought. And again, you can see it frames itself um, to the healthcare framework in its own way. So the patient impact uh, to experience on quality um, is, 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 is known. Um, so they are right. Long response times, delays, um, sometimes life-threatening illnesses, um, have caused um, and we've delayed have caused adverse events. Um, it's determined by the dispositions, um, how life threatening is their condition. Um, so, so a patient's impact to the experience is determined by all these things that sometimes um, we in healthcare assume they don't know, but they do. Um, they know the impact to the experience is determined by all these things. And um, they know if we take long for this particular aspect, it's not going to cause a consequence. But for this particular test in the emergency department, we, we know it will worsen our, our condition. So you hear them telling you, um, if I had come here just to pick results, I don't mind waiting, but I'm here with this, I'm still vomiting, you have not yet put in a line. So they know. Some of, they know the consequences and the impact of the experience in, in terms of long time wait or, or whatever. So I think it's, 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 it's important for you to see that they, they, can, they can measure quality. And um, patience and quality um, requires that, um, um, and, and, and this I read from one of the journals, that uh, um, early patient disposition will reduce the patient length of stay in pre-hospital care for emergency departments approximately half of the total burden of diseases in low-income and middle-income countries is caused by time-sensitive emergencies, acute illnesses, and injuries. Premature death, disability, and delays in receiving treatment of life-threatening conditions, such as MIs or myocardial infarctions, sepsis, stroke, and trauma are due to the large volume of patients in pre-hospital care and emergency departments. It is critical to consider patient experience and clinical practice in measuring the quality of emergency care. Patient satisfaction is affected by waiting times, expectations, standards, prior experience, and provider patient communication. So they know, um, and they are measuring it. In, in, in looking at it, patient outcome evidence on clinical quality indicators, um, they, after they, they said that, 
they ranked these indicators. And they said the first one is that because of that, patients die. Mortality from trauma, it's the highest with trauma-related chief complaint who die within 24 hours. Why? Because from a patient perspective and a measure of quality from a patient's eye, um, we are delaying them. So the second highest one was mortality from lower respiratory tract infections. Um, and this was on adult patients with a diagnosis of LRTI, which is lower respiratory tract infections. And, and the measure is those who die within 24 hours. Now, why am I showing those measures? I am saying, if then patients already know that that's a measure of quality, why don't you display this? These were their top rankings of what causes mortalities. Why don't we rank them? Would you like to see in an emergency unit today that, wow, their mortality rates are so low. I better be coming here. As much as I'm complaining, their trauma numbers are high, but their mortality rate is low, low, quite low. Do you, don't you want that presented in an emergency unit that your next visit so that you can make an informed decision on whether to come? As care providers working in that emergency, don't you want your great work displayed because you're doing a fantastic job to save lives and that your ranking, this is not your ranking number one problem? Um, the third one, believe it or not, in this, in this presentation um, was um, um, for children, the same diagnosis, but for children less than five years. Um, their mortality rates um, were also high within 24 hours. And the fourth was mortality from asthma. Believe it or not, I, 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 I said to myself, you know, um, if these are the top five, and I'll give you the next five, the next one. Those that live without, seeing, uh, without being seen. And imagine that's an indicator that is a top five. People walk away because, um, because they, they didn't have anything to do or is it because they are tired of waiting or is it because they can postpone their illnesses? Why, why do people walk all the way to emergency room? And I, and I had defined E-R-E-D to mean um, the emergency room or emergency departments. Um, is this at the top five rankings of patient outcome evidence on clinical quality indicators? And, and one of them is that, then you must ask yourself then, can we display this? Can we decide this is what we need to display and ask ourselves why patients walk away? And when you ask them, they will tell you. Um, they are beginning to ask for their rights and demands. They are walking away because they have more options. Perhaps that's true um, of the people who are around the cities. Perhaps in the bigger picture of Kenya, some don't have um, that privilege to walk away because if they do, the next facility is so far away. And maybe you as healthcare providers will have called them and said, don't, don't, don't treat that patient. They, they walked away from... I don't know, but those are indicators that were done in a study in Africa and, and, and in Kenya was involved as well. And those were the indicators that came as the top patient um, indicators on, 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 on measure of care. Now, um, introducing this mandatory one and balancing it to display versus the, the kind of um, environment we are in is difficult, but um, we need to align this with our medicine quality care frameworks so that um, we begin to understand that um, patients' rights and demands are changing, um, healthcare is changing, and the danger of not beginning to do that is people will fill the gaps. And, and I ask that if you, ha you have been a patient or your family member has been a patient, begin to demand of us uh, that we provide um, all these indicators to you. We be begin to ask for instructions of management from the care provider, um, ask questions when it's not clear. Um, and I repeat, demand of rights to ensure performance indicators are displayed in facilities, including your, the rates of um, satisfaction and experience. Um, and um, raise concerns in the established systems, of course, um, and, and in a controlled way um, so that your problems can be resolved. And most of all, 
um, participate in the feedback. Um, if you're able to do that as patients and family, and if our patients continue to do so and demand of us and all these things, then of course that measure of quality will improve. Truly what I say about this aspect of quality from a patient's perspective, the system cannot be fixed by the system. We can't be the same providers providing all these platforms, uh, standards, measures, and then fix the system that's serving the patient without listening to them and looking at quality from their perspective. So that's the part for patients. So back to the healthcare provider, as I was reading, as I said, uh, this is an article I read, the second part, participants were also concerned about corruption. Many felt that they were sent to buy medications that were unfairly priced and witnessed physicians leaving the hospital during their working hours to work at private clinics. And participants felt that healthcare providers lacked training in the basics of emergency care and are unable to provide appropriate care. So when I say whose perspective, do we ask appropriate questions as healthcare providers? You know, um, do you look at the patient in front of you? Do you know who you're dealing with? Do you know that these are human beings and that um, they're also looking at you? But I was saying our definition of our attributes, the following four defining attributes of quality emergency care emerge from a literature review and include immediate assessment expected of us, prompt decision making expected of us in an emergency unit, time sensitive and safe rapid diagnosis and critical interventions. Um, and, and so for sure, patients in critical, in, in, in critical emergency units, um, time is limited. Sometimes you have missing or sparse information, and yet you have to make rapid decisions. This is at desperate moments. Yet these attributes are important to our measure of quality. So emergency care providers, uh, clinical experts need to have that experience. They need to have that skill, and they, they contribute a lot to the capabilities of these attributes. So we're going to measure those attributes. And already remember the perception of what that article said that the Kenyan population felt of us as healthcare providers. Um, so for us to make those practical decisions, uh, because they said to us that we really, we, we, we don't seem to have the right qualities, trainings, and we seem to make delays or inappropriate care decisions. These attributes are therefore then important for our measure of quality. And for us to do so, timeliness in emergency care refers to that time, the first contact provider from the physician or the triage nurse. Um, and it also looks at, I mean, rather, it's from that contact time to the time we discharge them. It looks at the overall stay. And, and of course, the immediate care that you give um, it, to identify those life-threatening conditions. If that's a measure of care for emergency uh, unit, it's been proven that health interventions are highly timely sensitive. They require policies and procedures which we must implement and, and adhere to and a validation of sorts. It requires um, us to look at um, certain tools so that we are able, uh, triage skills, so that we are able to identify who needs to go where at the right time. Uh, so the antecedents, as I've said, are factors that are required for the concept of um, our attributes to occur. We need to be well trained. We need to have uh, the right equipment to be able to provide that care. Um, in our qualifications, we need to ensure that uh, we are looking at uh, optimal outcomes. I just quickly say, other than triage tools that um, I've seen, I've shown you out there in the screen, some use the Canadian one. Um, I have noted that um, the South African triage scale is also used. And a lot in Africa, I was reading the articles, that um, a lot of that as a measure of quality, because we are saying it's timeliness, so triage is more important in an emergency unit. Although it is used, they say it hasn't been quite validated. Uh, but again, um, our hospital centers, um, it's important for us to first pick the triage tool so that we determine that, um, that aspect of quick, reliable um, emergency quality care interventions in time. The, sec the second thing, and it's really pushing to it, it comes back to the antecedents of which include training, use of appropriate supplies and equipment. Um, we need to be trained, although nurses are mostly responsible for the triage, 
Therefore, in their basic life support, you must have that skill. It's essential that you understand this is not just about the, the, the triaging aspects. It's those that take care of emergencies, um, including the physicians. And so go to your advanced trainings. It's important for you to have them. Um, if you have to be working an emergency unit and making those decisions. Um, it is our responsibility to look at um, and participate in reports um, of outcomes. Uh, you need to follow up that feedback. If your facility is not measuring, it's your obligation to set it up, believe it or not. It is for you to influence, implement those measures that add value to you, that empower you, that make you a safe practitioner. It's not about them versus us. It's you, the healthcare provider, also have a responsibility. Already, you're being measured by the patient from it. And so I know you're also measuring yourselves from it. It's time for us to put in optimal and productive hours of work and service as expected in our contracts. It is integral and ethical to do that regardless of who's watching. And I put that in quotes um, because perception is we are not even there. We walked away. Um, so let's make sure we are in that. Um, we need to participate in writing, in researches, in policy making, in the pathways that are implemented. It's not, again, them versus us. We need to be measuring ourselves from it. We need to attend or participate in continuous learning sessions for core clinical care uh, um, sessions of practice, in addition to other learning subjects and, and that add value to us in life, like financial, how to deal with your finances. Very important topic, uh, but it's also important if you're working in an emergency unit to still do the core clinical care uh, attendance sessions. Healthcare providers need to provide equitable care to all so that we are not seen to be discriminated. It's important for healthcare providers to work within their scope, your credentials, your privileges, and perform that, that you are delineated to do. Um, I think many, not many of you, but some of you may remember that. I put that one there. It was in the public. It was in NTV, where a malaria job was admi administered in 2015, actually, to 28 children. Um, at some place in Tesla, and if there's anyone from their uh, Tesla constituency, and that left the children with various levels of paralysis. And I always use this when I'm talking about healthcare pr practitioners to remember it's important for you to remember your scope and, and remember what you can and cannot do. And if you're not a healthcare provider in an emergency unit, please don't give um, what you cannot and you're not allowed to give. So that's our responsibility. Then we'll be moving to quality, but if we don't, uh, and we think that we are looking for miracles, doing exactly the same thing to tomorrow as you've done today and achieve in completely different results, we'll be expecting a miracle. And I don't think we want to work with miracles in healthcare. We want to work with actuals. Um, clinical effectiveness is difficult. It's a real commitment. I can't tell who is the healthcare practitioner, whether it's the auditor pointing, whether it's a patient pointing, whether it's the facility owners pointing at you as practitioners, but we need to learn that to be effective, we really need to be committed. And in finalizing this, I said, I'll throw in one little word, uh, insurance and corporates, uh, payers, um, a way of looking at perspective of quality. Should they influence the quality of care? Is cost of healthcare not an indicator of quality health or, care, uh, or the lack of it for that matter? I think as I finish this, that it's important to listen to them, involve them appropriately. That's insurance, corporates, and pairs. Even though they are not seen as the bigger ones, um, it's important to provide them with information for them to make objective informed decisions within the approved frameworks. And you yourselves be involved in participating in their forums to determine how to cost health or how to pay out health. This means policy level, NHIF, insure, um, at NHIF level. Um, and on the other side, participate in that, fill in those forms well, insurance forms, um, those pre-authorizations, um, but of course within the realms of confidentiality and everything that comes along with it. And, and so in conclusion, I think um, in emergency care and in providing quality, quality is expensive. Value equals quality, divided by costs, innovation, economies of scale. But if you think quality is expensive, try the cost of done quality. Thanks so much for listening to me and being patient as Anteni Sana. Let's move on to perfection. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some questions uh, in the Q&A, so I'll just pose this to you. What are the resources being measured? What are they being measured against? Uh, when do we appropriate this phrase 
in which context within Africa um, is there a measure that we say we can employ to say, because I said, yeah, if you're comparing us to the West, then we may say our resources are limited compared to the West, but what measures on which can we look at developing a local metric and saying we are not resource limited because we have enough resources within our context. I don't know what your thought process is on that. Um, when we say resource limited in our setup, it's because a lot of guidelines or protocols or, or some of the adopted standards are not necessarily from our numbers, our disease burden, our type of facilities. Um, we then adopt these guidelines, genuinely so, and, and in implementing them, then you find that the kind of resources that require that to be measured are sometimes out of reach. Um, and so, yeah, it starts at that level. And, and I think you answered it in that, then what are we measuring it against? Against standards, which standards, the ones you've adopted. So if you adopt great standards that can measure your quality, that um, in, in implementing them, the resources you provide to measure that at reach, then it's okay. But why I say resource limited is especially if you are adopting one that is not necessarily found within our type of disease burden areas. On the issue of physician burnout because of understaffing, how do you balance, because everyone is living, I mean, especially emergency care providers, a lot of them are going to the West. How do we balance um, low staff numbers, high patient volumes? and people getting burned out and still being expected to provide quality care. In the drive for numbers, we are burning out a um, certain, certain level of practitioners in the emergency units. And if we are not careful, as you said, we are already, we are already having them um, living. So how you balance it? Um, I think we said effective setups of um, genuine look of your disease, you, what kind of uh, service you provide? Um, what are your numbers like anyway? Then you staff a problem. You know, then you measure against um, each and every of those elements. I think in that way, you will then have to balance that burnout because if you don't address the root problem, which is understanding what are your volumes, what are your throughputs, and the kind of level, the acuity that you have, then set up your staffing needs based on that. And, and then hopefully um, you'll be able to um, uh, deal with that. That said, you can do all that and not attract them because maybe you are not uh, perhaps remunerating them enough. So there is a complexity of also how much are they willing to come to you if you're not paying them enough. So it's a whole load of another discussion, but all those are important. Um, there isn't one answer to it, but every one of those things matter. And, and of course, equipping them with the right knowledge and skill to be able to handle those uh, throughputs of patients. Uh, for clinical governance to maintain a level of excellence, the provider must accept critical criticism and agree to change. Is this practiced in our facilities, our healthcare providers happy to receive criticism and want to change? What's your experience? Criticism is not always taken well. That is a fact. But it does not mean we do not um, continue to speak out objectively and respectfully within the mechanisms we have. Um, so, yeah, be prepared um, to, to receive negative and be prepared also to be surprised for positives. I will say in our setup, a lot of what you've seen as improvement is because there's a sincere, sincere resource um, provision from the senior leadership. I, I will say that honestly. Um, well, it doesn't mean that um, once we are given the resources, we do not give feedback. Sometimes for the receiving of feedback can be quite questioned, but it, it's something that we never give up on. Um, these are indicators of health, and we said uh, change is sometimes very difficult. So, yeah, don't give up. Evidence-based care tools across all specialities, should we be adopting them to ensure quality and also harmonize communication between the different specialities? I think we talked about evidence-based tools being, there are different tools to use. Don't use one and not another. I, in my view, use different ways. There isn't anything wrong with using evidence-based tools, but I am urging us here in Kenya, researchers, uh, writers, write more so that our evidence is based on our, 
our setups, our researches, data that we've collected within our realms of, of healthcare. Um, and that way, then we have evidence that comes from us, um, that works for us. And that's understood with our nomenclature, um, really. It's a good thing, but it's not the only thing that measures quality. But it is an absolutely good thing. How do you achieve quality assurance in a community? Most of them can't speak English, uh, but are really suffering due to hearsay from the community due to some quack doctors. So where there are good PR people who are potentially maybe or may or may not be healthcare providers, so they really don't get the science and the big English being spoken in the big hospital, uh, but are more reliant on the community, I'd say community health providers that's there. So how do you achieve quality assurance in that situation? I was, <laughs> that's a very good question. You know, as us the other day, uh, actually, sort of the same question on our standard of care. How do you know that the patient has understood what you're saying? Are you interpreting it? And, and, and I think uh, I was with one of my colleagues in, in one of the, in the forums of data, data protection, actually. And it came from that angle. How are you informing them in terms of consent? And so in the same practical way, how are you informing them in terms of quality? How are they informing you on what they need or what they are not happy with if you're not understanding each other? And, you know, the challenge was in that we were told it is up to us to ensure that the patient has understood you. Now, therefore, just means, if it means we use translators, if it means you look at your setup and look at your patient and, the, and their way of communicating, their language of choice, then you will need to conform to that for us to fit in as healthcare providers um, in terms of relevance and in terms of getting that quality that they need and that we, we will be satisfied about. So it's back to us. We have to set up mechanisms of um, communicating to, to the patients that we take care of. In a hospital, Ayohakin, we push to the level of having translators um, around us. It's that effective. Now, when you move away into Tanzania, uh, you find they've translated everything, almost all the information in Swahili, and a lot of their providers have to speak in Swahili. Now, it means as Kenyans, we have to begin to ask ourselves in this environment where I'm working, um, how do I speak this language to be able to provide that quality care and so that I also get quality feedback from my patients? So, yeah, we have to set those standards for ourselves. Suggestion box versus face-to-face -face engagement in terms of judging quality of care. Um, how effective may be our suggestion boxes in getting feedback from uh, or measuring quality? None is perfect. All, all can work. We have provided... I think you can do all. You can provide boxes where people can write. You can do surveys. You can have uh, focus groups. You can uh, send out um, questionnaires. It's, it's really all of it is you're trying to look for feedback in the different ways, um, in the different communities. And, and so do that. Do it. It's, I, I would say just to answer, it can't be the only way. It's effective, but it can be done on its own in isolation. Neither have the rest also shown that they are the best. So I think you can use them all. But don't use that one of suggestion boxes on its own, in my view. Maybe one or two more last questions on this. I know there's a, in the Ministry of Health is a Department of Quality of Healthcare, and they've been trying to work on standards. But um just not even just going to public there are multiple standards um different facilities across the country have been trying to achieve mainly in the private sector but um i think also some public sector areas also and mission hospital areas also trying to achieve so there's things like uh what you have at Aga Khan's jcia there is isos there is there's multiple can you comment on the different accreditation and should facilities be pursuing to get some form of accreditation, not necessarily one over the other, but just is it something that is beneficial to the facility? Does it improve? Does getting accredited by any of the bodies improve quality of care from all the different perspectives? Any form of certification or accreditation from an external body adds value to your quality journey. Now, it means that what we in Kenya have seeing the ministry where the quality department is have different quality tools that they've circulated to us, it means 
the intent is right. They placed these platforms for us. They gave us quality indicators. They review them and they give us as providers to measure our quality. What I think they needed to move to is begin certifications or they are in if they've gone to be accredited as a unit of ways to credit institutions. And that's why I said in my slides, it's time we start star rating. I know the health, Kenya Healthcare Pro Professional Oversight Authority is working with them to star rate, um, to start a discussion on star rating institutions and which will be displayed using the model of quality that is from the ministry or international they are in for the additionals. That way you aspire to be better. So yes, I think it is very important for any healthcare institution to enroll themselves in certifications and, and in accreditations of quality. There is not one I'm going to say is the best in the world. One isn't. I am saying certification and accreditations of quality are relevant and important. They help you also look at a cycle, think through that it's not just your own internal measure as someone else is coming to confirm the great work that you do. And, and I think it's very, very important. Last question, specifically now for maybe emergency department or pre-hospital care, how do you go about setting up key performance indicators or how do you start measuring some of these things? Is like what process do you go through to come up with performance indicators and measure quality? Okay, you start by having data. You start by looking at what you have. What do you have at hand? Which data do you have? Collect it, convert that data to information that makes sense and begin to set platforms of indicators. Because for you to measure something, you need to know what you had, what, what is it? So then you begin to, to, to do that. And the second element is look at others and see what do others measure in an emergency unit as an example. And if then what you've seen is your data or your information and you don't have it, then that other becomes another way of of creating those performance indicators. So it's two ways from what you have, look at the data, work on it, performance indicators. What others do as evidence to show performance, for example, in an emergency unit, look, pick those, and then become it becomes your performance indicator. Start slow, build on, and you're gonna get there.